Awesome. Thank you. So um, the myth of the normal curve and what to do about it. Before I get started, I just want to say it's a real honor and privilege to be speaking here. I have been benefiting from the Python language and Python community for a very long time. Yes, and so thank you. I uh, really appreciate learning from you all, and I hope to teach you something about statistics that might surprise you. About me, I am a data scientist at DeepNote, and for those of you who don't know, DeepNote is a fully collaborative data science notebook, and actually we'll be doing some statistics simulations in DeepNote uh, throughout this presentation, so you'll get a, a feel for how it works. For some reason, I developed a passion for statistical software development, and uh, I'm not really sure how that happened. Uh, I was a bit frightened about stats when I first started learning about stats in like second year university. Um, but for I think over 10 years now, I basically try to find new methods in statistics, and I just write the code for them in Python and try to share them and communicate them to other people. Uh, my real goal is to try to build bridges between uh, concepts in statistics that uh, might be a little tricky for people to understand and, and try to draw people in if they're just a little bit anxious about statistics or if they're just learning new methods, um, that kind of thing. So it's really about um, building those communication bridges. That's, that's what I really aim to do. I have a background in cognitive neuroscience. That's where I learned about statistics, uh, actually in an EEG laboratory. I met a lot of very smart people there and they sort of showed me the ropes and uh, now I'm trying to pay it forward. So where are we headed with this presentation? <clears throat> We're gonna learn a lot about the normal curve and various other normal-ish curves and how they affect our statistics. And I'm gonna use that as a jumping off point uh, to hopefully introduce you to some modern methods that you may or may not be aware of. So we're going to answer these questions. Do observations in nature actually follow a normal distribution? Some people call the normal distributions uh, God's curve, so we'll take a look at that. Do small departures from normality actually have any practical impact on our statistics? So if something you know, looks pretty normal, it's symmetrical, it's bell-shaped. Does that actually matter if it's slightly departed from normality? And finally, uh, can we actually test our hypotheses? So if you're doing like inferential testing, A-B testing, that kind of thing, can we actually do those types of tests without assuming some uh, shape, uh, some theoretical shape, like a normal distribution or a T distribution or some other kind of distribution? So we can start with the first one. Does nature follow a normal distribution? And there's actually quite a few papers on this, and I, I just think it's quite fascinating because I think in pop culture, and maybe, maybe it's true for some of us as well, we tend to think of this idea that if you collect enough numbers in nature, it will follow a normal curve, and there's lots of theory around this. Um, people have actually empirically looked at this, taking a large, large number of data sets, very large data sets, and seeing are these statistically uh, normal? And actually, according to many uh, sources, no. Um, every, every, um, every source of evidence we can see right now says that uh, even if you collect massive, massive data sets, so they don't necessarily follow a, a normal curve, significantly so. Uh, this, this fellow here, Theodore Michietti, uh, he really has the best title, uh, the unicorn, the normal curve, and the impro and other improbable creatures. I highly recommend checking that out. It's, it's, it's like the canonical source for, for starting to learn about uh, you know, what distributions really look like in nature. Uh, you can also see where I get my title inspiration from. Okay, so do small departures from normality even matter? And uh, I'll, maybe I'll ask you, you folks a question. Uh, there's two n distributions here. Does anyone know which one is the normal distribution? You can just yell out a color if you want. I got a vote for orange. Oh, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> My colleague is here. She already knows the answer. Anyone else? Orange. Okay, some blues. Some blues. Hmm. Okay, so that's like 50-50, let's say. All right, so far. Uh, 
Thank you for participating. The, uh, the orange curve is a standard normal curve. And the blue curve is called a contaminated normal curve. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it was a total revelation to me when I saw the effect of contamination on statistics. But um, these, these distributions look so similar, and that's the point. Graphically, uh, seemingly, it's a small departure from normality, but I want to show you a few things. The key thing that you want to look at here is, are actually the tails, the sides of the distribution. You can see, if you have really good eyes, you can see that the, uh, the contaminated normal, the blue curve, has slightly, we say, slightly heavier tails, all right? And uh, that basically boils down to a higher proportion of outliers. So the contaminated normal curve is like a normal curve, but it has a higher proportion of outliers in it as a fraction of um, high variance outliers. Okay. But does it really matter? So let's look at contamination and its effect on statistical power. By the way, all the, these results are not mine. Uh, these are from Rand Wilcox's books and writings, and uh, he's really the one building bridges, but I'll introduce him a little bit later. But anyway, on the left side, we have two normal populations, and as you can tell, there's a sizable effect there between those two orange curves. And on the right side, we have two contaminated normal, uh, contaminated normal distributions. And again, they have an equivalent um, effect there uh, between the two blue curves. So let's focus on the left side for a second. We've got these uh, normal populations. What we can do here is we can sample from each of the orange curves and compare them with a t-test, right? And we can actually do this many, 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 many times and just look at the proportion of times we found a significant difference, and that gives us an estimation of power. Power is the, is the probability of finding an effect if there really is one, and there really is one. So what happens when we look at power for the normal curves and we repeat that procedure for the uh, contaminated normal curves? We get a result like this, where under normality, the probability of finding effect is, is really, really high. It's essentially you're always pretty much going to find an effect. And that's good because there actually is an effect. That's what you want, high power. You alter these distributions just slightly in the tails, as I mentioned earlier, and power is dramatically reduced. So this is a pretty striking example of how something that, at least with the eyes, seems like a small departure from normality can actually uh, have a pretty wild effect uh, in reducing power. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a demo right now for you, and uh, please say a prayer. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, like what I'm really interested in, like I'm not a statistician, what I'm really interested in is the communication of this material, and I, I really like empathize with students and people who are just getting into this stuff. So I wrote a notebook. You can, this is in deep note, by the way, you'll see how it works in a second. But this notebook is like available to you. You can read my SciPy uh, paper in the proceedings this year. You can click on the link. You can fire up this notebook and, and run it right now. And what this notebook is, is a collection of different, si very easy to understand simulations and visualizations that uh, try to communicate some of the core concepts of robust statistics and sort of where the traditional statistics kind of fall apart. So I'll walk you through um, a couple of uh, selected functions here just to try to underscore or add more context to why slightly heavier tails would reduce power to such an extent. I just want to um, add a little bit more context to that and give you a sense of what this resource is in case you want to use it for your classrooms or for your under own understanding. So let's design a population. and. Can you see this decently? I think probably, right? OK. Let's design a population, and we'll make it normal. And we will um, set the variance to 1. So it'll be like a plain Jane standard normal curve. And there it is, our best friend, God's curve. OK. And we're going to estimate what's called standard error. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's, it's not as uh, difficult to understand as it might seem. What we're going to do is we're going to set the sample size to 40. 
And we're gonna actually resample many, 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 many times from this population, and every time we do that uh, sample, we're gonna calculate the average, or the mean. By the way, the mean is like worth a presentation all on its own, how interesting the mean behaves, and maybe that's a talk for next year. But let me run this experiment and plot all of the resulting means from all of those simulations over and over and over and over again. And if I run this uh, block a bunch of times, then that distribution will slightly change, but you get the idea. It, it, it's like if you're familiar with central limit theorem or like law of large numbers, then you might have predicted this would look somewhat bell-shaped and everything. Okay, fair enough. So now if I look at the standard deviation of that blue collection of means there, uh, the standard deviation is also called the standard error. So this is the standard error of the mean here. It's 0.16. And that's relative to other situations. That's actually very low. And you want error to be low. So just remember that number for a second, 0.16. And let's take a look at what happens when we design a different kind of population, maybe a contaminated normal, and we'll give it some level of contamination. It's actually the same level of contamination that I uh, showed you earlier. We'll build the distribution. Okay, so there it is. It look, look, pr looks pretty much the same, right? Well, we got some slightly heavy tails. All right. We'll keep the same uh, measure of central tendency, uh, the mean. We'll keep the same sample size, and uh, let's see what those means look like when they're plotted. Okay, it doesn't look that much different, at least to the naked eye. Sometimes you might see like some longer tails here, mm-hmm, okay. And then when I run the standard deviation on that curve, I get something that's like over twice, uh, twice the value of standard error. So what does this actually mean? And how does this help us to understand why power would be affected? Well, you know, like as some of my wonderful teachers told me, shout out to Tim Murphy, um, most statistical tests have in the numerator an effect, some different score, let's say. And in the, in the denominator, what's in the denominator? Error, right? It's like all the noise in the data, right? So you want error to be low. But under contamination, because there are so many outliers, error ends up being, well, it ends up being higher than you'd like it to be. And this contributes somewhat to larger confidence intervals, more error, and power goes down. So hopefully that gives you some idea of how you can reason about these things using a laptop and uh, some pretty straightforward code. All right, um, now, there's so much more I wanna show you in this notebook, but I don't have tons of time, uh, and I wanna stay within the scope of this uh, presentation, but I can't help myself, so I will show you a few more things. Um, I also have in this notebook just like a little um, a little chart here to show how standard error behaves as a function of various measures of central tendency, like our friend the, the mean and other more robust measures like the trimmed mean, um, but also as a function of various population shapes. The TLDR here is that the mean performs very well uh, for standard error um, when it's coming from a normal curve, essentially, when the population is normally distributed. Whenever populations end up to, uh, being quite skewed, like let's say log normal, or they end up having heavy tails, like contaminated chi-square or contaminated normal, then the mean kind of falls apart in terms of standard error. Standard error goes up. So the mean is, is not very robust if our measure of robustness is, uh, if our proxy for that is standard error. On the other hand, though, if you look at something uh, more of like a modern, so-called modern method, like the trimmed mean, it actually holds its ground pretty well across a variety of different types of distributions. And one thing that like I've heard said many times, and it's maybe like one of the best statements about statistics is, we want to try to choose methods that perform well under normality, but continue to perform well when distributions are not normal. And why is that? It's because we don't really know what our population looks like. That's what we're inferring. And so it's nice to, have a method that actually uh, can perform well uh, across a, a wide uh, variety of different scenarios we might encounter. Okay, 
And uh, I can't get into the issues with the T test, but the T distribution is a close relative of normal distribution. It has its own set of problems, and uh, uh, they're definitely problems you'll want to check out. And then at the very end of this notebook, I have something that uh, is maybe the coolest part. It's kind of like build your own distribution. Rather than se selecting a label like contaminated chi-square and, and, uh, and plotting that and looking at the standard error, what we can do here is just adjust the skewness and the heaviness uh, as parameters and you know independently of one another. And this allows you to essentially use those two parameters to build any kind of population distribution you would want that you can reasonably do with those two parameters. And then you can compare type one error rates between a traditional t-test and a more modern uh, analog percentile bootstrap. And um, TLDR here is that when populations are skewed, type one error goes up with traditional methods like the t-test. Um, percentile bootstrap though, it holds its own even when distributions are skewed. And when tails are heavy, like I showed you earlier, uh, power goes down, percentile bootstrap test holds its own relative to the t-test. So uh, that notebook, I highly recommend you check it out. There's all the like formulas to draw from these distributions and everything, and I think it's a pretty nice resource uh, for students and anyone who's learning. All right, thanks for the prayers. That worked out. Okay, so have all these problems with I have all these problems with these uh, traditional methods and maybe some of the heuristics that we use, you know, when we're talking about the normal curve. Maybe they're not true. So what can we do about it? Can we actually test hypotheses without assuming some theoretical shape, like a normal curve, like a t distribution, or even like an f distribution or a, a, some other distribution in the back of a textbook, right? Uh, and the answer is yes, actually, for like the last half century, uh, statisticians have been creating all these incredible analogs to our traditional methods, uh, and they don't suffer from the same afflictions. So I'd highly recommend uh, you check out uh, Robust Methods. I um, was fortunate enough to publish a paper and a software library for Python called Hypothesize. It is, to my knowledge, the only uh, Python library dedicated exclusively to robust methods. And um, it was my great honor to publish this paper with Rand R. Wilcox, who is, is the, he's the statistician who's taking all of this really complicated stat research and bringing it to a level where, you know, the rest of us can actually understand it. I mean, he really is absolutely incredible. Um, he's written, you know, thousands of papers, the most incredible books. He breaks down, ex down examples, you know, with numbers, and he really communicates incredibly well. Um, all I did with this library was I took some of the functions that Rand has. If you go to Rand's site, he has literally thousands of incredibly useful, robust stats functions, and they're just sitting in a text file, literally a text file. And I just took them and I wrote the Python code for them. They're in, written in R. Uh, RANs are written in R. I just converted them to Python, wrote a nice API around it, and you know, added it to the Python library ecosystem. So I did nothing more than just convert what he had to Python. So he's really the one to thank for this. Um, OK, more prayers, please. I'm going to show you a little bit about Hypothesize. And um, here's my. GitHub repo. What I really want to draw your attention to, though, is this launch in DeepNote link. And so this is like, um, by the way, Hypothesize is highly documented. If you're just getting started in learning, there's plenty of examples that walk you through the core concepts. But what I want to um, reference again is really my, my passion, and my, I, I really think it's a gap is to try to onboard people to these methods in a smooth, sort of low barrier to entry kind of way. And so what I've done is um, I have these little launch and deep note buttons. You can click them, and if you're a student or you're just learning, every single statistical test in Hypothesize is associated with a, uh, basically a launch and deep note button. And it will fire up a notebook that's already pre-populated with all of the example code. It shows you how to use ex every single function or every single hypothesis test. And uh, my hope is that this will like, just get rid of some of that 
initial friction whenever you're trying to learn a new uh, library and a, and a bunch of new concepts along with it. So this will just fire up DeepNode and you can uh, start using um, the functions that uh, that are associated with that with that launch link. Um, I let's see here. I'll show you just briefly this one that I just fired up here. So this is called, thank you, this is called WinCore and it's an analog to Pearson's R. So if you, if you know about you know, uh, Pearson's R, you're just sort of comparing two columns of data, you're comparing two uh, quantitative measures. So when you click on that launch link, it installs Hypothesize, it <laughs> imports the WinCore function and it creates some example data in the structure that the function expects. It runs the function and it spits out the results. And here you can see, you know, there's a p-value correlation and, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, you can actually see this, all of the no, all of the f um, hypothesis tests in uh, in hypothesize are actually associated with notebooks. So you can actually just scroll through them, and uh, hopefully that will help people learn. And the last thing I want to talk about before I run through some brief conclusions is I often get asked, do modern methods make a difference with real world data? Do they actually matter? And so what I have here is a really fascinating study on sexual attitudes between males and females. It's a real data set. It's collected by an author called Miller. Uh, it's linked in my SciPy paper. But basically, they had thousands of males, thousands of females, and they asked them this question. How many sexual partners do you want in the next 30 years? And if you think about that for a second, you can only imagine the number of outliers in this data set. And it is really difficult to know how to even deal with that statistically. It's, it's incredible, but it's a perfect example. Now, if you take a traditional t-test and you compare those uh, the, you know, males and females in terms of that question, we cannot reject the null. We cannot reject the null. The p-value is 0.3. If we switch to Ewan's bootstrap t-test, which is in Hypothesize, uh, named after the statistician Ewan, um, we can actually reject the null. Uh, the p-value is essentially zero. The confidence interval uh, does not include zero. So turns out males want uh, more sexual partners in the next 30 years, according to this data. OK, so let me walk you through some conclusions. The normal curve is probably not God's curve. At least that's, that's what uh, the evidence suggests. Even when things look normal-ish, they still can have like pretty brutal problems, especially with power when the tails are heavy. Modern methods, though, are here to help. And I think it used to be the case, maybe it still is, that it was hard for people to onboard to new methods. You know, you kind of learn what you learn like in the early years of university and you just stick with those tools and that's that. Um, but the modern methods are here, they're ready to use and, um, you know, um, there are people like Wilcox and to some extent myself who are trying to, to communicate these uh, to people who want to learn. So three calls to action. You can visit my GitHub repo, um, either for Hypothesize itself or the Robustics, uh, Robust Statistics Simulator. Although again, if you read my SciPy paper, there's links to the ac actual notebook and I'll make sure that's in that repo as well. If you want to contribute to Hypothesize, it's as easy as it could possibly be just grab a function from Wilcox's text file, write it in Python instead of R, and issue a pull request, and we'll have more robust statistics in Python. Please check out Rand Wilcox's books. These things changed my life. Uh, it was amazing the amount of evidence uh, you know, for robust methods and maybe against traditional methods. The book on the left is a real easy read. The book on the right is more technical, so I'd suggest starting with the first one um, if you have any doubts. And lastly, uh, visit DeepNote. If you like that notebook that you just saw, uh, it's an incredible place for data science and analytics. Paradoxically, like Python, it is simple, it is easy to use, and incredibly powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your good talk and for giving time. We finished a minute early. Um, we have time for some questions. I saw there were a few on the Slack channel, so let's start off with that. Okay, uh, we're gonna start with Dylan Stewart, who asks, 
What measures do you recommend that work better with contaminated distributions? Jensen, Th Shannon, Rainey, Zenter P. Mm. Well, depending on what you mean by measures, um, I would suggest if you're doing inferential testing, um, so the, the goal a lot of the times, one of the sort of heuristics I use, if you take a traditional method, it has some non-robust qualities to it, like the mean, so if you think of the t-test, the mean is not robust, and the standard deviation is not robust either. These things completely fall apart if you start messing with the shape of the population. So one approach is to replace the mean with some robust analog and the standard deviation with some robust analog, and that's what my robust tests do. One thing that's quite promising is the trimmed mean, and the trimmed mean is nothing more than trimming off the some uh, proportion of values from each end of the distribution and calculating the mean on the remaining values. That has shown to have incredible practical value if you're testing uh, hypotheses, and, and, and it holds up very well under contamination. The other thing that you can use in conjunction with the trimmed mean is some other way of actually comparing your test statistic to what you'd expect under the null, that doesn't include assuming some theoretical shape, like the one in the back of a textbook or the thresholds you would get from running a function or something. And that, uh, that basically boils down to using some resampling method, like bootstrapping. So bootstrapping means like pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. It means taking the data at hand and creating a sampling distribution against which to uh, to determine whether you should reject the null or not. If you combine trimmed mean with bootstrapping, those two things together are an incredible pair and have an amazing practical value. Great, thank you for the question. Um, are there any questions in the room? Go on over here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I haven't followed this field for a while, but I, the last time I looked, uh, there's discussion on using M estimators for robust estimation. So what do you think about those estimators? I think they're pretty good. I think I showed one, the one step M estimator uh, in, in, one, in that little, little, little like a heat map chart. It seems to perform incredibly well. I think it's like, um, when I read Wilcox's stuff, he, he has like a whole section on M estimators and they really, they seem to have quite a lot of value. I'm not entirely well versed on the trade-offs there. Um, I, th I think he ends up usually saying, you know, M estimators are really great, but still the 20% trimmed mean seems to have the most practical value in the widest number of situations. So they are incredibly valuable. Um, the, the real question is, are they, when are they useful when a trimmed mean is not useful. That's what I would like to know. So yes, they're, they're incredibly useful, certainly better than traditional me uh, measures. Okay, we have another um, question from our remote audience. Um, so Zachary asks, what are some real world scenarios for which a contaminated normal is a good model? Hmm. I don't know. I don't. I don't really see. I mean, it depends on what you mean by good model. You know, I. I think. I think if we're. If we're being realistic about it, and we're actually looking at the literature, we should expect that distributions contain outliers. So I would say that. Contamination is probably a model that actually reflects reality in a lot of in a lot of cases. So. Um, what we want to make sure, though, it, it's, fine if a, it's fine if the population is contaminated. What we want to make sure of is if we're comparing groups, that we're using methods that actually take that into account, right? And so, you know, sometimes you'll have people saying, well, outliers are good. That's a data point. Why would you want to get rid of that? You know, this says something. And yes, but when we're looking at comparing group differences or measuring associations, we have to keep in mind the strategies for dealing with outliers. So I think it's not so much that the contaminated is either a good model or a bad model. What I would say is that it probably is a model that you should expect. Great. I also have another question on the audience. Hey, uh, did you try to uh, investigate median absolute deviation and how robust it is to this contamination as compared to the trim mean? Um, 
yeah, I don't remember the actual numbers, but um, um, but yeah, it seems to have some practical value as well. I, I don't remember the exact literature on uh, median absolute deviation. Although, if you'll permit me, I did say one thing about the median, though, because the median is absolutely fascinating. So a lot of people will say, well, okay, so the trimmed mean, yeah, 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 yeah. We already have the median. Like, let's just use the median and there's, you know, bias, bias variance trade-off and, and all of this. Um, of course you're gonna have sh smaller standard error if you're trimming values. Of course you're gonna have, so look, I've had this conversation many times with folks. It's like, if you're trimming values, the standard error is gonna go low. Of course, it just makes sense. But the counter example to that, which is so fascinating, is think about the median. The median is actually the most extreme form of a trimmed mean, isn't it? It's like if you trimmed everything off, you would be left with just the median. So in a way, the median is kind of a form of a trimmed mean. And guess what? On a normal distribution, the median actually has quite high standard error. And that's a counterexample of just saying trimming, well, of course, trimming is just gonna reduce standard error. Not really, because if you trim to the max, on a normal curve, the median actually does not perform as well as we would hope. And I actually, I demonstrate that in my notebook, but we didn't get a chance to talk about it until now. Hi. Uh, so uh, I have got a question. I'm new to the industry. So uh, in practice, we may use a lot of estimators at the same time. But for example, if the mean and trimmed mean like results in different conclusion, like which one should we like draw a conclusion upon? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that's the question we all kind of want the answer to. You know, wh which one is reflecting the truth? Um, it's a pretty complicated thing to answer. I, I would say you can only do your due diligence here. Look at the previous literature. Look at your distributions, examine your raw data, really take a hard look at that stuff. And then you might wanna say, hmm, which methods are the ones that are robust across, across a wide variety of scenarios? Because in everything I've been showing you, the one trick is that I'm creating the population distributions. But in reality, we don't actually know what the population looks like. In theory, we can never know. So I would say, hedge your bets, choose methods that, that are, are going to keep you safe uh, regardless of what the population might look like. That's the only advice I can give you. All right, thanks so much. I'm gonna take one final question from our virtual audience. Okay, our final question is from Paul Ansel, who asks, have you found measures like the hodges lehman sen metric or Rousseau-Croy's SNQN metrics to be useful, robust stats, or are the, those not as informative? I don't even know what those measures are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds like we have some uh, food for thought. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.